we are back, y'all. We're going to do it again. We're going to do it another again. Yes, we are back uh, in the studio one more time. Surely, uh, <laughs> how y'all doing tonight? We're back for another episode. Yes, we are. We sure are. I hope. I sincerely hope that you all have had a great week since the last time that we talked. Hope hope everybody has been in great health, great spirit. And uh, we're going to go on ahead and continue this train. All aboard! Train is about to leave the station. Yes, it is. Because we're going to pick up where we left off on last week and we're going to talk about some more stuff. I tell you what, you all are simply amazing. I got to say it. You know, on last week's episode, we were talking about deceptive pastors and lying pastors and kind of piggybacking off of piggybacking, excuse me, off of the video that I uploaded about the ego driven pastor shaking his tail feathers in front of his members. And we kind of got involved and we kind of got deep in some stuff regarding other issues centered specifically around pastoring. And we're going to kind of continue that on tonight. And uh, this is something that needs to be talked about. You know, oftentimes you hear the flip side of things from the pulpit in the church. And it's usually about the members, of why, about what they're not doing, what type of sinful life that they're living Usually you're sitting on that side of the uh, issue. Well, very few messages or very few talks or very few conversations that you will hear that are actually centered around the pastor and his sinful nature. So I'm not here to try to create a environment, if you will, that's church-like. I'm just a man that has church background and a man who has church experiences and a man who has church history in a, not only a single church, but many churches. That is giving you some perspectives on things from a point of view that you quite not, that you haven't quite heard, maybe from a pulpit. So I'm kind of here to show you a few things that maybe you may have uh, not quite thought about or maybe you have thought about it and you never said anything or even dared to say anything because of some of the things that I mentioned in that last video. Being scared. Don't be scared. We're going to talk about some more of that tonight. Yes, we are. Um... Uh, the overall response to the last video has been outstanding. Uh, the questions, the comments, the likes and shares that you all, that you guys have, you know, contributed to the actual video. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You know, you guys are listening. Apparently, something that I'm saying is, is helping some of you all, at least some of you all. Okay, you can't help everybody, and I'm not trying to help everybody. The information that I'm speaking on, it goes to the ears of those who are uh, going to be uh, going through these such things and or have been through these such things. Those are the individuals that is going to, you know, the, the, the information is going to fall on. They're going to hear that. So we're going to kind of pick up. We ain't going to spend a lot of time here. We're going to just jump right into um, some of the topics that I was kind of talking about on last week. Uh, I wanted to touch more on the being thrown out of church. Uh, that seemed to be a very hmm, sensitive as well as um, point that was talked about that seemed to have got some people stirred up. That's okay. You know, 
I'm here to stir you. If you want to be stirred, then by all means, I'm going to do that. Because I'm not going to sugarcoat the issues because it's, you know, dealing with your pastor or you know it's your pastor and you have a problem with it. That's your problem. You got to deal with that. Uh, my suggestion to you, sir, or you, ma'am, is pray about it. See what the Lord have to say about it. If you're sincere and you basically are sincere with knowing the truth of issues and, and matters, I don't think that God is going to deceive you like your pastor. I think that God will actually, believe it or not, you ought to try it. I believe if you sinly, if you are uh, uh, truly sincere and you want to know the truth on issues, I believe God won't deceive you like your pastor. I believe that God will actually show you, whether it's through this video or whether it's through somebody on the street and somebody says something on the job, or you're just in the grocery store getting you some cereal, eggs, cheese, ham, and somebody stops you and tells you something that was related to this video, God will let you see. He'll let you basically be, you know, uh, inspired by what you're hearing because you'll, you'll get confirmation on it. God ain't going to deceive you. No. He's not in the business of deceiving people. I think a lot of you all don't want to ask the Lord about this, a lot of the stuff that you hear being talked about. You dare not ask the Lord about it because you, you feel like somehow or another your mind has linked that to his judgment too. I talked about some of this last, last video. Y'all think that doing the right thing is going to bring about God's judgment because you've been programmed to feel that way. You have a man, a pastor, who has somehow programmed you to thinking that you can't question and or say anything about his wrong or what he do because that brings about God's judgment because that's God's man of God and he's going to deal with him. Nobody's saying that you are supposed to, uh, by all means, you know, uh, do X, Y, Z and, you know, get, uh, get involved with all the specifics of, you know, pastoring. We're not talking about that. We're talking about simply seeing it for what it is and questioning it. But I believe that if you truly want to know, yes, if you truly want to know the truth on issues, why don't you bypass your pastor? Try that. I dare you. I dare you. Yes, you, sir, ma'am. One looking at me now, trying to see what this video is about. And if it's something that you can utilize, something that can help you. Or maybe something that you can take back to your pastor and show him. Hey, pastor. I dare you to bypass him. And go to God for yourself. I dare you. What, you don't want to do that? You're afraid the Lord might show you that this information that's being put out is actually the truth? You're afraid that the Lord Jesus Christ might actually bear witness to what's being said here, and that is the truth. And then that would throw that that would overthrow your faith, because everything that you had invested in your God, your pastor, has got to be thrown away and discarded, put down the drain. You're afraid that you might have to do all of that. If the truth is actually known. So no, you don't want to know it. Some of you, you don't want to know it. You already know it, but you don't want the confirmation from God because then that would destroy your whole program. You'd have to do things differently. You'd have to take accountability then. You'd have to leave that church or you'd have to hold your pastor in accountability. We don't want to do that because we have our comfortable uh, our religion that we go to every week and we sit up. And as long as you know, we ain't being bothered and the pastor ain't rebuking us and we good. We ain't saying nothing. We good. Uh-huh. See, some of y'all, y'all, as I touched on last video, y'all do church well. Y'all do it real well. Y'all have perfected the face, the movements. Yeah, all of that. Mm. Y'all got all that down packed. Don't mean nothing. But that's what you've been trained to do. Feel the anointing. Not be in the anointing. Feel the anointing. So with the anointing, comes a face movement and comes a, a jolt and, and, and you know certain movements and certain faces see what we we got to show the people that you know we somehow anointed and we you know God is touching us God ain't touching you he ain't doing none of that stop playing with God some of y'all been playing church so long that it's come second third nature to you 
You go through the procedures. I talked about that in the last video. You go through the procedures. Go up in the church and get excited over a song. You ain't no different than being in the club. Get excited over a song. That's emotionalism. You can have emotionalism without having anointing. And that's what a lot of these churches are experiencing. You got a lot of emotionalism going on. And don't get me wrong, we all emotional, especially us black folks. With our history, where we come from, you know, we naturally have a natural movement to ourselves. And we, you know, we're rhythmic. We are uh, a, a people who have rhythm, you know, that is in our loins and in our ancestors. You know, they love to dance and, you know, we just... That's just who we are. We bring all that into the church. Yeah. We are emotional individuals and we love to be emotional. And uh, if, so, if there's some good music being played and you got a pastor that, you know, is. <laughs> hmm. Ha! Oh, we're going to pack them out. Sure. Are. It's all emotionalism. You don't see Jesus doing none of that. You don't see Jesus doing none of that. Uh, I told you on the last video, I said, you know, as long as we see something performing, we don't care if the gifts and the healings and the tongues and the preaching and the anointing. Yes, devil's anointing. Uh, we don't care if that comes from the devil because we are so blinded by the showmanship in the church that we are emotional beings, and so that emotional experience is translated into anointing, when in reality, you're deceived because that emotional experience alone does not equate to uh, anointing. Well, you may be thinking and saying, well, you can't have an anointing without emotions. Yeah, that is true, but you can certainly differentiate between when somebody is just in the what you call spirit of self, and when God is... He has his spirit in the man. You can differentiate that all day. But then when you have become accustomed to doing church, <laughs> this comes automatic. Sometimes we do it because we don't want the pastor to think that, you know, we're not sinful and that we are, you know, anointed. So we want to uh, always keep up the, you know, performance, if you will. Uh, I talked about in the last video, and I'm going to touch on this a little bit more. I talked about people being put out of the church. And of course, you heard me elaborate on that. You know, I basically went in depth, gave you scenario after scenario and example after example of God and how he and Jesus, uh, how they were not in the business of throwing people out of the church. I thought about that and... I wanted to kind of extend on that and kind of give you all a little bit more to chew on. You know, sometimes you don't get the stories. You know, you see these pastors who, and I touched on it, they have a church. It is their church. They may say, oh, it's God's church. But clearly we know God is not throwing people out of the church just because you didn't look at the pastor right or, you know, you showed up to service late three times and, he sat you down to put you out of the church or you was eating dinner with somebody that's no longer in the church. So he going to pitch out, put you out the church and, you know, and tell you to never come back. What, 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 huh? Put somebody out of the church and tell them to never come back. Now, I thought about that after I said it in the last video. And it really dawned on me just the severity of what you're saying. You're going to tell somebody to come. You're going to put somebody and kick them out of church because they had dinner with somebody and then tell them to never come back. Then hang the phone up in their face. Don't even give them a chance to explain and or tell you their side of a story. But then you go on ahead and hang the phone up in their face. Uh, you're not a pastor that's after God's own heart. You're not a pastor that loves souls like you sit up here and lie to your folks and tell them you do. Uh, you are a pastor who is obsessed compulsively obsessed with the fact and notion that you have got to have control over somebody's life. Well, let's look at that. Uh, members are not yours. They don't belong to you. Okay. Uh, you have got a serious 
serious uh, spiritual deficiency, when you feel that you are supposed to somehow have more influence over a person's life and in a person's life than the Lord Jesus Christ. Where do you get off telling somebody that they have influence over, you know, uh, you should or you should have the notion that you should have some type of influence to the extent that you're not supposed to talk to another person because they're no longer a part of the church. Now, help me out with that one, because you deal with so-called sinners every day. OK, whether it's online, on your job or in the streets. You talk to them every day. You sit in fellowship with them every day. You even invite some of them to your church. But when it comes down to certain individuals who are a part of the church who have, who, or who have been a part of the church, somehow or another, that breaks down the fellowship right there. You can fellowship everybody else as a sinner and in the world and have business and dealings with folks all over the world. But then when somebody who's no longer a part of the church... Uh, is no longer there, then you, 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 you feel, I guess, that somehow they're a special breed that's outside of the other sinners. And I'm saying sinners because that's what you're calling them. They're sinners because they're no longer there. Not speaking to the fact that this is a fact that they're a sinner is the reason why they were put out to church. I'm just speaking to the fact that you call them sinners, so we'll go with your narrative. They were sinners. They're backsliders and they're whatever else that you've labeled them. And so I guess they're a different breed. Yeah, they're a different breed. Uh, anytime you have a pastor who puts so much focus on destroying a member or an ex-member, and he's taking the focus off himself, he's doing that for a reason. Let me give y'all something to think about. If you see a faithful member, let's just say, individual, he or sh he or she has been in the church, they've been faithful, they have supported the ministry, the pastor, they have supported his, his endeavors and have been there and have been on point and have pretty much been in pocket in the ministry and they are supporting it financially, mentally, physically, and definitely monetarily. All of a sudden, this faithful individual or faithful group of people just simply disappear overnight. Am I go missing in action? Don't hear nothing from them no more. Don't see them no more. They don't show up to the church no more. Just am I after they have been all of what I just named and have been that in pocket for years. You mean to tell me that you members don't have enough common sense to know that there's some foul play going on there? Oh, you told that, oh, they just didn't want to live right and they was never living right and their life wasn't about nothing and they had all kind of stuff going on and you know see that is a that's a distraction I have to distract you and give you information that's misleading and manipulative and simply flat out just a lie because if I told the people the real reason why they left then that would hold me in accountability and I'm not gonna do that I'm not gonna put that type of responsibility on myself <clears throat> as a no good pastor to tell you all the truth no, because see, I always have to keep the focus off me and I have to give the impression that I'm always pastoring and I'm perfect and I'm doing the perfect thing 24-7, 365 days a year, 24 hours in a day. I have to keep y'all with that, you know, uh, impression of me as a pastor. So there's no way that I'm going to put the spotlight on me to say that I contributed and or I was responsible for some things that Perhaps I was confronted with as a pastor that I didn't want to have anything, you know, to, to do with. I didn't want to, you know, uh, challenge those things because I knew that what was being asked of me was truth that I couldn't, you know, refute or debate. So I ain't going to get into all of that. I'm just going to try to, you know, point to you all and let you see a narrative and a, a storyline that is uh, false. Uh Spiritual manipulation and foul play at best is what that is. Why do you say that? In fact, let me break it down for you. What is spiritual manipulation? What is foul play? Well, that's simply that you have an individual. Let me give you an example. 
When you have a murder scene, you have the authorities, they come to the scene, they tape it off, they basically secure the area so that there's nothing that's tainted, the evidence is protected. Nothing is tainted and they're protecting the, the crime scene so that when they do their investigation, they can kind of see all the evidence and then come to a conclusion based on that uh, in helping to solve the, the crime, okay? Sometimes you will have situations that play out where somebody was murdered and they try to make the appearance of that murder seem to be or give the appearance that it was a suicide. So they go to the whole extent to make the crime scene look convincible. They basically get the suicide letter together and present it and have it at the body. So when the authorities get there and they look at the evidence, by right off the bat, without any investigating and looking at it, it just has the appearance, the appearance of suicide. Well, when you have somebody that's really good at what they do, and they can really dig down and look at the evidence and look at the common sense, look at all of the facts and figures and, you know, the actual situation in its entirety, and they put all this stuff together, one who's sharp and intelligent enough and knows his job, he's going to look at the possibilities and not stay in the box and keep himself, you know, on one level to say, you know what, I'm not going to look at this from the grand scale. I'm going to look at this and I'm going to take it and, and, and really investigate it in its entirety to see what's actually going on here. What happened here? A true investigator. That's what they're going to do. Uh, these are the ones that solve crimes that appear that basically somebody has committed suicide when in reality they were murdered. These are the ones that solve crimes that basically help to get somebody set free when they were falsely in prison when they, for something that they didn't do. But there was evidence that was presented to show that, hey, in fact, not only did he not do it, but you know what? He needs to be you know, uh, compensated for this time that this man spent in jail. So foul plays involved here. Well, spiritually, you can have foul play in situations. This is simply that an individual has given the appearance of something that they want his members to see. He wants y'all to see things a certain way, so he's going to give you the information and present it to you in such a way and in such a fashion that from the surface it's going to look like, oh, yeah, it was suicide. He just killed herself. Yeah, she just killed herself. She just left the church. Sound familiar? You're connecting the dots now? But every once in a while, you have somebody that's bold enough to stand up and be that investigator, that true investigator, and actually put the facts to the table. Look at it for what it is. Certain things will add up. But you will take this uh, example that I'm giving. The individual will, you know, try to get away with the murder because in reality, you know, for whatever reason, they didn't like the person, so they just simply murdered him. And then, you know, to keep the, the heat off of themselves and to keep the, you know, focus and attention off themselves, they, you know, had the suicide letter, you know, drafted up and they present that in hopes that the authorities will see it and they'll just, you know, not do no in-depth investigation and rule it a suicide. Well, pastors that do the same thing, they are doing the same thing. They want you to think that somebody committed suicide. In reality, there was a murder committed. Some of you all know it was a murder committed. Why do I say that? Because some of you all have seen this happen over and over and over again. People being put out, excommunicated. This is not anything that is basically new to you all. You've seen it before. You've seen many cover-ups in the ministry that you've been in. But you never said anything about it. Never mentioned it. Because you felt like, you know, I will be put out or I'll get in trouble with God. Well, your pastor, he's the one that has used, used this uh, uh, example of spiritual manipulation and spiritual foreplay to his, uh, foul play, excuse me, to his advantage. In some cases, he may have had foreplay. Anyway, uh, uses this spiritual foul play to his advantage. You know, he tampered with it. He fixed it up. He presented it in a way that, you know, well, this can't be questioned or it can't be, you know, refuted because, you know, I'm the pastor and nobody's going to dare stand up and say anything. And he'll even be as bold to say, has anybody got any questions? He know y'all ain't going to stand up and say nothing. And the ones that do stand up and say something, you're dumb enough to just jump on board with it. Pastor, I'm with you. I'm with you, pastor. Yes, I'm going to stand with you in your wrong. I'm going to stand with you in your injustice. 
I'm going to stand with you in the fact that you having this meeting and you doing it behind the individual's back that you're talking about and they're not here to defend themselves. I'm going to stand in your wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is what it is. <laughs> this is what it is. Uh, people are shocked that this goes on. Strangely, oddly enough, yeah, it happens. It happens. And, you know, the, 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 the killer thing about it, if you really look at it, sometimes the pastor will employ in his deceptiveness, he will employ his minions and they will involve themselves in this pastor's scheme and scam, misinformation. Yeah, some of you all. You basically involved in the scam yourselves. You helping the lie to stand and you helping the lie to be true. How are you helping? Because he got you doing research, got you online looking up information, got you looking on Facebook trying to see what the members or ex-members are doing, what they're doing, who they're doing it with. And in some cases, you're driving around looking, going by houses and doing drive-bys. I ain't talking about the kind with the guns. I'm talking about the drive-bys with your eyes at night. Sometimes 3 and 4 and 5 o'clock in the morning. Coming by houses and trying to see who's there and who ain't there. And trying to see where they at and what they doing. And then you bring this information back to your pastor. And then he get up and lie and act like he getting such revelation from the Lord. In reality, he getting information from his members, but he see all. He to see you. Mm-hmm. You don't see nothing. Only thing you see is death, doom, and destruction. And you don't see anything about yourself that seemingly, and, and I'll say this again, you, some of y'all pastors, you ain't about nothing. You're not about nothing. You know, in my last video, I talked about, you know, you good pastors out there doing the work of the Lord and how you have labored and love. And, you know, the things that you've done to help souls out instead of trying to trip and be a stumbling block to souls. Y'all keep it up. Keep doing the work. Lord has not forgotten you, the good ones. But as I've said before, you devils. Yep, you got your minions out there. Trying to basically see what they're doing. Now, my question is to you, if you've excommunicated people from your church as a pastor, why do we feel like we got to try to keep up with folks? Seemingly, you should be, you know, focused on the other things. Y'all so-called members that's on board with them. Why aren't y'all focused on living for the Lord and going to heaven? Why are you so focused on what other people doing? Hmm? Why are you sitting up trying to figure out what people doing, who they talking with and who they fellowshipping with? Huh? Your life is so boring, it is so, you know, uh, drastically unimportant that you have time in your life to, to sit up and try to, you know, be a, pri a private investigator, spiritually and mentally and physically, to try to assess what, person, what a person's thinking, what they're doing and who they're doing it with. Some of y'all members have been duped. You agents, you are minions. I mentioned this in the last video. video. You're minions. You're around here bidding your pastor all these devilish deeds, and you're part of it. You're not helping to solve the problem. Are you helping? Are you looking at all these things, and are you investigating all these things because you want to see the person saved and, and back into the church where they can live saved and, and basically make it to, to, to be with the, uh, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in heaven? Is that your point? Is that your, you know, your whole purpose of, for, 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 for doing that? Or are you basically just trying to be a, a garbage collector? Mm. You collect garbage. You know, you like the man that ride on the back of the truck. You know, he got a route that he go and pick up trash. Everybody's trash. Uh-huh. You on that spiritual garbage truck. You ride around and basically look for garbage that you can find. And then you can bring back to the collective. So it can be sorted out. See what we can use. Try to get something on somebody. Y'all just as sorry as the pastor. 
I actually feel sorry for you. I do. Uh, if you realize the scope of this man and who he was and the actual things that he's doing don't have nothing to do with God, you would quickly realize that you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't even associate yourself with such things or such people. Why don't y'all have more value for yourself? Why don't y'all have more self-respect for yourself than allow a man to use you like that and allow a man to basically tell you anything that's to the destruction of, you know, everybody else in the world? There's nothing wrong with us. There's nothing wrong with my pastor. There's nothing wrong with this church. But you don't have any growth in it. You ain't had a member join the church and stay there in 11, 12, 15, 20 years. And you think it's because don't nobody want the gospel. I touched on this. That ain't it. That's not it. God have many sheep that's not of that fold. Not at your church. So how is it that he only going to speak to you in that church if he got other people that's not from that fold? That right there is a contradiction. That right there should tell you something. When you hear your pastor stand up and tell you that God only talking in this place and he only talking to me. That right there, just giving you common sense. I gave you that one for free. You're welcome. He got other sheep that's not from this fold. So who are they? Cer certainly they ain't the building that you at. So what's your pastor talking about? That God only talking there. That you only going to be saved there. Hmm. Well, y'all need to wake up. Y'all need to wake up. Uh, and you understudies. You know, the foundation of the church should be the brethren. They should have the uh, uh, spiritual fortitude and the strength. Deacons and, you know, uh, individuals that are under the pastor. Y'all should be the ones who are the backbone of the church. Not just to do the labor either. Not just to cut the grass. If you're good enough to cut grass and plant plants and and, and do keep up the Lord's house and vacuum and, and, and clean the toilet bowls and do everything else uh, that's required of you, then you should also be required to basically keep things in check when your pastor get out of line. Why y'all weak brother not saying nothing in these churches? You sit up there and let your pastor sit around in round table discussions week after week after week. Sit up and trash preachers. Sit, sit up and trash members, ex-members. Y'all sit up there like zombies and nod your head. Yeah, pastor. You show sure enough right. Mm-hmm. You show sure enough right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pastor. Mm-hmm. You know, pastor, I thought about that. You know, that's just right. Everything is right. Everything you're in agreement with. You know he ain't right. But then as soon as you turn your back, this man at another table talking about you. Talking trash about you. You watch the man sit up and invite people to your church. And basically they come to the church and whether they're invited church, whether they're invited minister, whatever the situation is. And, and sit up and, and cheese and grease with the people and the guests. As soon as they turn their back, he trashing them. Now tell me where you saw that in the Bible. Where did your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ do that at? When he sat around with the disciples, most of the time he was talking in parables, giving parables. He wasn't sitting up trashing individuals. You don't even see him in the last, uh, the, in the last situation with Judas. He sat around with the church and he's going to trash Judas. Or anybody else for that matter. I gave plenty of examples. Plenty of examples in the last video. The woman that was caught in adultery. He didn't trash her either. Didn't trash her. I gave y'all an example. I saw, tell y'all how the church folks pretty much they just dropped, they they rocks and 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 you know it's amazing because you know Jesus and I said figuratively speaking in that example he was the pastor in that scenario. You know what was amazing about that is that after the fact, when the church members figuratively speaking came to Jesus the pastor figuratively speaking and they gave the report. Uh, Jesus being the man that he was, he understood what restoration and what reconciliation was. He understood that was more important than sitting up and de destroying the woman's uh, uh, faith, destroying the woman's character, destroying the woman's uh, 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 hope, and even having a chance at, 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 at reconciliation. How are you as a pastor going to sit up and destroy an individual and throw them out to church and then take away the hope and restoration that they would have. Now, it sounds to me like you think you have the keys to grace. 
And if I like you, then I'm going to extend the keys of grace to you. But if I don't like you, then somehow or another, I'm going to take back the keys and grace to you and you can't be restored into the kingdom. Who are you? Now, imagine if God was running his system like you, pastor. Imagine if he was running his program like you, that you get thrown out of the church seemingly like, you know what, hey, and then tell somebody, don't you ever come back. Man, you got serious problems. God ain't talking to you. He's not talking through you. You are the manager. You are the president. You are the CEO of your own cult. And you run it as such. If you cannot control, you cannot influence, you cannot direct, and you cannot simply tell others what to do, when to do, and how to do it, then you feel threatened. Some of y'all pastors, you know what I'm talking about because I'm talking to you. The ones that's looking at me right here. Yes, right here. Can't control people so you feel like, you know what? Those that are intelligent enough to understand your, your con and your hustle, you got to get rid of those people. Why? Because you don't want to infect the dumbed down people that you already have under your spell. You don't want them to see that, that they can actually have liberty and freedom. That they don't have to eat, you know, an apple if they don't want to. They don't have to feel like they have to eat an apple. I don't even like apples. But you're going to make me eat one because you think that I should. I like oranges. That's what I'm going to eat. And I'm not going to feel bad or obligated to eat an apple because you feel like I should eat one. I'm just giving examples. Uh, divide and conquer. That's what the pastors are doing. Divide and conquer, what you talking about? Well, divide and conquer just simply means that if I got somebody in the church or my church that I don't too much feel too good about and I don't like them, then I have to figure out a way of how to divide them from perhaps, say, loved ones that they have in the church. Maybe you got a family. I don't like you, but I feel like I can't control you, so... I ain't going to come at you directly. No, that would be too obvious. So I'll come through the back door. Maybe I got a family member. Maybe I got a child that I have more influence over than you as the parents say do. So I'm going to go at that child and I'm going to basically address the child and I'm going to go at the child in such a way that's going to have the child acting funny and, and indifferent towards the parent. Why? Because I don't really feel too good about the parent because I can't control the parent. The parent actually has a mind. Not that he don't have a mind or she don't have a mind to follow what the gospel is and what Jesus Christ is, 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 is advocating. But they have an individuality personality and they have their own mind about things. Seeing things for what they are, questioning things. Listen, uh, if you are in the military and let's just say you have a CO, you a private and you are in the military, you have a commanding office, that's what the abbreviation or, or the uh, acronym is, CO, commanding officer. And you have a problem with that CO. And then you as a private, you go to that CO and you ask, hey, look, can I speak to you? I have some things that I want to talk to you about. CO agrees with you, you know, y'all go behind closed doors and you go off to the side. And the private says to the CEO, hey, listen, permission to speak candid and blunt. And the CEO says, permission granted, private. Well, at that point, the reason why that is done is because the private understanding the ranks and the authority that the CEO has, he wants to talk to the commanding officer in a way that's off the record. He just wants to express himself because he, he wants to tell it like it is and he don't want to be held accountable and thus, he says, permission to speak, you know, blunt. Permission to, you know, speak candid, sir. And you grant that permission. Then at that point, all bets off. We're not talking about private to CEO. We're just talking as two men, two women, whatever the situation is. So at the end of this discussion, you get mad, you get offended as a commanding officer. 
and not only do you not take it off the record, you put it on the record and you take it back to the rest of the platoon and you present it to the platoon as if this 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 private was disrespectful to you and he basically was out of line. But you as the commanding officer told the private that, you know, he could speak candid to you. You told him that. You told her that. Okay? But then you get up in front of the platoon and you lie. And you say that the private was disrespectful. And then on top of that, you give him a dishonorable discharge. Where does that happen at? And in what military does that go on? Because the private had something to say to the commanding officer, who, by the way, gave him permission to speak his mind. Then he turns around and takes what he said to him and try to utilizes it to basically uh, uh, give him a, a dishonorable discharge and then talk and tell the rest of the platoon that, you know, he was very disrespectful. You a liar. You a liar. So if that don't happen in the military, and I'm giving this example to basically make a point as a pastor. Why do you get before your people and you tell them lies about members that were no longer part of your organization when you know certain things didn't go down the way you're talking about they went down? Why is it as a pastor you feel that you have to totally dismiss yourself from any accountability and responsibility and how members are falling by the wayside because you have, as a pastor, been a stumbling block, but you don't want to take accountability? You want to put it off on the member. Or members must have been something they did. And you members, you so dumb and stupid and dumbed down. You know, it always is the assumption that, oh, it must have been something that the member did because, you know, our pastor, he's anointed of God. There's no way that he's not way. There is no way possible that my pastor could have said or done anything to infect or affect the reason why a member has left the church. And if you believe that, you might as well believe that elephants can fly too. Because at the end of the day, I don't care what you say about your salvation. You are entitled and you have the ability, contrary to what you hear, to make errors. Errors are going to be made. It's not a problem in making the error. The problem comes in is with you you know, when you as a pastor makes an error and you turn around and try to, instead of taking the responsibility, put it off on the member. You know, different than Joseph's brothers that tried to basically kill him and put him and leave him for dead and then take the report back to the father as if some wild animal had got him. And then even go to his father and manipulate and take the man's coat with blood on it. To try to convince the father that indeed his son was dead when y'all left him for dead. Hmm. Isn't that funny how that story happened? But in the end, they had to come back to the very one they tried to kill and left for dead. Be careful. Be careful who you discard and who you throw away because you never know how that merry-go-round comes back around. Apparently we haven't learned that yet in all these years in preaching holiness and in salvation and speaking and preaching the word of God. And yet we still have in our hearts this hatred for man to the point that if we can't control them, why are you so bent on controlling anybody's destiny or anybody's mindset or anybody's decisions in life anyways? I talked about the marriages in the last video. You get a pastor that gets between two husbands and wife, it gets between a husband and wife. This is what I talked about just a second ago with the children. Divide and conquer. So you get a pastor that don't like one spouse and he got another spouse that's on his payroll, figuratively speaking. That means they will pretty much, you know, do whatever it takes to stay in the good graces in the eyes of the pastor. So they are little agents, little minions. They run back and pretty much report their spouse to the pastor on every issue. Huh. Your spouse passed gas. Pastor, I got to report this to you. Yeah, he passed gas last night. Uh-huh. I just want you to know that uh, he passed gas and uh, had the whole house smelling. Yeah. And, uh, Pastor, I just want you to know that because, uh, you know, he might come to the church and pass gas. I just want you to know that he the one that's doing it. <laughs> Oh, boy. 
This stuff happens, y'all. It's real. But you will have a pastor come between a spouse and, and, and basically infect one's individual mind with a bunch of junk and a bunch of poison. And, uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, you have one or, or both of them who pretty much, you know, they don't have any type of, I guess, mindset to even look at things from a common sense perspective. And then usually there's usually some foul play happening there, too. Uh-huh. Yeah. Usually in situations like that, you got one that has stepped out. And that's trying, and, and, and they will try to hide that too. Because in reality, uh, if it's found out that, you know, the other individual stepped out and they are on the pastor's minion list, then uh, we can't have that information get out. So what, we, so what do we do? We get up and we say, well, the other individual, the other spouse, they stepped out. They was the one that stepped out. Got to protect the internals. My investment. Yeah. Gets deep, y'all. I'm touching all of it. This is what's happening in the church. This is about pastors who have egos, once again. Pastors who feel like they uh, have to control everything and everybody. And if they can't, you know, then the only other option is basically to destroy you, destroy your character, destroy your influence with people, uh, destroy relationships between you and others in the church. Sometimes, as I alluded to, sometimes those relationships that are destroyed and that cost you being in the church is the destruction of relationships with your children, your spouse, family members, church members, and the list goes on. This is what you're dealing with in man-ran churches. I talked about God's church and how you can't be thrown out of God's church. That's so true. You can't be thrown out of the one place that God has ordained man to come to in order to get help. Because if God gave you men that power, you mere mortals, that type of authority and powder, power, then there'd be a whole bunch of people to be damned and be in hell right now because you all would have called time on them years ago. See, your grace and your mercy is only extended to the members that are in good favor and good standing with you. Those are the ones that you extend grace and mercy to, the ones you can control. That's a man's grace and mercy. You think you got the keys to grace and mercy on the spiritual realm because you call yourself a man of God and that in and itself somehow gives you some type of delegated spiritual authority and power to give man grace and power and give man grace and favor and give man grace and, 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 and some type of, uh, you know, favor with God. I've even heard some try to use a scripture to say that, you know what? I'm an apostle and I can retain your sins because the Bible tells me that if I retain your sins and I can loose your sins, you know, uh, on earth and I can loose them in heaven. You sound like an idiot. You're totally out of line and you're totally misconstruing the, the scriptures because I'm going to try that one on you, too. If you have that type of power, what happened if I'm in my, if I'm in my sin and you've retained it? as you have so-called stated that you have the ability to do, you retain my sins on earth and you lock me up on here in the spiritual realm on earth and it take you to release me on earth as well as the, the, the spiritual realm, then I got two questions for you. How would I ever be saved if the Lord decided to take you off this earth and you got my sins retained with you when you're going in the ground? How am I going to get forgiveness then? Oh, Okay. Perhaps I'll go back to the one who basically was who I should have been going to from the, from the beginning, the Lord Jesus Christ. Second point, if you can retain my sins and you can pretty much lock me up down here on earth in the spiritual realm, then as I stated in the last video, Jesus Christ, who is the only mediator between man and God, you done replaced him then. Because he's the only one that can basically go to the Father and pray on my behalf or anybody else's behalf for that matter. So how is it that you have replaced him? I guess I got to go through you as the pastor 
to basically get my sins forgiven because you don't feel like I should have them forgiven. So you get up in the church and have people standing in fear and scared because you done said, I've retained your sins and I basically hold you in spiritual prison and spiritual hostage until you do what I feel is right in my eyes. And then I'm going to go and release it on the spiritual plane and God going to forgive you up in heaven then. Then what is Jesus Christ? What is Jesus Christ uh, here for? What did he come here for? If you got that type of power. See, some of y'all pre preachers and some of y'all pastors use twist scriptures. You have people that are ignorant, dumbed down, simple-minded people faking this stuff. But then you forget, the, you can know on one hand that this is the word of God and Jesus who is the mediator between God and man. And he's the one that died on Calvary and died at Calvary and basically set man free with what he did in the redemptive work. Somehow we forget all of that when we're listening to an idiot like you talking about you can retain a man's sins. Y'all need to get educated. My people, they, they perish for lack of knowledge. God alluded and he told us that, and it's so true. You sit up in church and listen to your pastor tell you this dumb stuff. Won't have the common sense to kick in, and you certainly ain't going to do the research and basically see what God has to say about it. Understand what the scripture was talking about when he said that. He wasn't saying that um, somehow he gave the apostles and he gave these preachers some special superpower. That, you know, while Jesus was, you know, taking care of some on the other side of the world, he was too busy. So you as an apostle, you have the ability to forgive sins and, and retain sins. He wasn't talking about that. But this is how you all have used this to manipulate people and keep them under control, thinking that they are basically under your subjection and that, you know, you are their God. You might as well say this what you are, because that's how you're trying to operate. As if you some type of God. You got the power to retain and forgive sins. Okay, well, if you die and you get in the car wreck or whatever and you out of here and I was in a sinful state, then how am I going to be forgiven and how am I going to have a chance of salvation? Because you ain't here. You don't retained it. So I can't talk to you in the ground. Six feet under, I can't commune with you in, in, in the afterworld. The dead know not what the living doing. So how am I going to talk to you, pastor, and, and get my sins forgiven so you can go talk to the Lord? Y'all people need to wake up. Wake up. False prophet. It's what you're dealing with. If your pastor is telling you all this junk and he's spewing this to you and having you believe this, it ain't got nothing to do with God. That man is, he's taking scriptures, he's manipulating, and he's dividing and conquering. That's what I started out with talking about. We're on the same subject. Still dividing and conquering. I'm dividing information. I'm basically manipulating information. And, uh, I'm giving you what I want you to have and twisting it so that I can get the desired outcome and results. Knowing that you're not going to question it because, you know, here's the scripture I can show you. See, that's what the scriptures say. Rightly dividing the word means studying and understanding the context of the word. Because clearly, at the example I just gave you, that cancels out the whole notion that the man can basically retain your sins. He's not literally figuratively talking about a man can do that today, because if he could do that, then my goodness, you'd have a whole lot of uh, tyrants around here. You know, you don't look at me the right way. You don't do what I feel you should do. Then I'm going to retain your sin and I'm going to, you know, lock you up in hell. Because I don't like you. Or you mess with one of my favorites. You did something to somebody that, you know, got my back. So I'm going to call myself the spiritual mafia now and, you know. I'm going to call in and lock down your sinful nature on earth and God ain't going to release it in, earth, in heaven until I say so. Uh, anything that a man can do, has done, will do, Jesus already covered it. His blood of Calvary, what he shedded, his blood, has already covered any sin that man will ever commit has already covered any sin that man will ever uh, speak of and the only one that is not covered is blaspheming of the Holy Ghost but outside of that yeah can no man retain nothing on this earth and lock you up because if he's basically having that ability and that power and that authority then he's more important than Jesus Christ who's sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven. 
And we know if you are one to believe that, then you sure enough, are, you, you gone. There's no hope for you. No hope for you. But then perhaps there is hope for you because you're hearing this right now. And perhaps it's the first time you've heard this information put out to you in such a way that makes it simple for you to understand it, makes it simple for you to digest it. I'm not a biblical scholar by any means. I don't claim to know everything about the Bible. I don't claim to be a um, uh, some type of biblical or spiritual guru. That what I know, I know. And I'm speaking facts and I'm speaking the truth. That's good enough, regardless of what your degree of understanding or your degree of education is. When you speak the truth, it don't matter how educated you are or how many degrees you have. Doesn't matter how many doctrines and or masters, whatever else and label you want to put to yourself and your credentials. If a man is speaking truth, no matter what your background is and your credentials, your title, apostle, whoever, bishop, whoever, man speaking truth. The truth outstands and outshines anything and any kind of title and respect you think you have from man. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me, through me. So he done canceled out your retaining sins, Pastor. You can't retain nobody's sins. You ain't got nobody in a spiritual prison because you don't like them. So you want to basically have them come before the church and sit up here and lie and acknowledge you. Y'all, some of y'all members are actually dumb enough have done it and too dumb enough to understand. You're going to go back to a church where you know your pastor wasn't right. And then you're going to stand before the church and apologize to him because you because you took a stand. Come on. Boy. Hmm. I tell you what, this uh, this right here, it's manipulation, it's witchcraft. That's what it is. Call it what it is. You're being bewitched. It's witchcraft in the church. Manipulation is a form of witchcraft, and you got it operating through your pastor. And in some cases, it's actually witchcraft going on as well. Yeah, that's happening. You got your pastor fooling with elements of the earth and taking dust from grave sites and concocting spells and talking to the devil and, and entreating spirits to try to bid him what he want to get done. It's going on. Yeah. See, this is the type of sick, twisted mindset that some of these pastors have. See? Uh, when you're that far gone, there's nothing that you won't do. There's nothing that you won't engage in. And you don't mind, and, and certainly the enemy don't mind you preaching holiness. He doesn't mind you doing that at all. In fact, he needs to have some type of cloak in place in order to pull all of this off. So what better cloak to use than holiness? Quite brilliant if you think about it. Use holiness as your cloak to basically function in the dark uh, corridors of Satan's kingdom right there in the church. This is why you have pastors that can simply do anything and everything to their members and have no conscience. Uh, you're out here going out of town and taking road trips with female members. Locked up in the hotels, having sex with them, fooling with them, going out of town with your family members, having your sex capades, episodes. Mm. You don't think nobody know about this stuff, the stuff your pastor doing. I told y'all at the beginning of this broadcast, if you want to know the truth, 
and you don't want to be deceived about anything and you want to know what's really going on in the corridors and in the shadows of the church and with your pastor and the lineage and the dark secret history of the church, all you got to do is be sincere and ask the Lord and he'll show you these things. I told you in the last video and quoted, the Lord showed me, call unto me and I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You think scriptures like that are there for you basically to not utilize with sincerity and that he won't show you things? Like your pastor doing everything that he can think of to do? Sick, twisted, demented, mental problems, con conflicted spiritually? But in the whole time, he's using witchcraft and manipulation and he's using all of these things to keep his members in the dark. And from y'all's perspective, you don't even understand and you don't even know it because you sleep. You don't understand what's going on, the, the, the dark powers that's at, at play here. You don't understand all this stuff. Because you don't seek the Lord. You don't have a close enough walking relationship with the Lord to see this. Because everything and every answer that you get, you get from the pulpit. If some of you actually would take the actual courage and dare even step outside of that realm of things and, and, and actually seek the Lord for yourself. He'll show you the stuff. You won't be deceived. This is why he left that there for each and every man. Seeking out your old soul salvation. What is he talking about? That's what he's talking about. He didn't leave that totally up to your pastor. Or rather, to strike that, he didn't leave uh, the responsibility totally up to your pastor and for you to totally depend on that just that alone because at the end of the day you can sit up and say well my pastor told me this and you know he was a man of God and I thought this and I thought that and you know I had these I heard the prophet liars yeah I said prophet liars get up and say something in relation to the, the man of God well let's examine that oftentimes when you're in a church like this and you have a man that is uh, a liar, he's deceptive. He'll have those, those minions again. There they go. There they go. He'll have those minions in place too. Prophet liars. Who, who, who and what is a prophet liar? Well, a prophet liar is simply someone who calls himself a prophet or prophetess who gets up and everything that they got to say. And it's strange and oddly enough, the only time when they get up and say something. The Lord only speaking to the pastor and he only encouraging the pastor and everything he got to say is directly to the pastor. Listen, prophecy is about things to come. It basically tells and foretells of what things are going to happen. And then when you see those things happen, glory be to God because he spoke on issues that were going to be. You give him the high honor and high praise because he spoke to his people and warned them. Prophesying is not you getting up and simply every time God opened his mouth, he's saying and encouraging his pastor, so-called pastor, or your pastor, or he's giving a word of encouragement to the pastor and he's only talking to the pastor. And then he's prophesying and basically speaking to your pastor and telling them about things that's going to happen that, by the way, never happened. And strangely and loudly enough, it's amazing these prophesying when the stuff don't fall through the way they said it was going to happen, they get quiet. God didn't, I guess he done left the building. He get quiet too. Because they don't have nothing to say when it fall apart. But you have these minions, these prophet liars, they'll get up. And funny and strange and odd thing about that, as, as true as the spirit of the living God is, why ain't he bearing witness to your pastor's deeds? Why ain't the prophet liars getting up and saying anything about your pastor committing all these uh, 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 offshore sins in the church? Things that he's been doing has been in his lineage and in his history for the entire time he's been pastoring. Y'all won't say stuff. You and other brethren in the church competing about who can get a sister in the bed first. Huh? Hmm. <laughs> Ooh, John, you going down this rabbit hole. My goodness. It's getting hot in here. Hmm. Yeah, I'm talking about you, Pastor. 
But y'all prophet liars will stand up and, you know, y'all are what I call his spiritual cheerleaders. You get up and cheer and rah, rah, about to have a convulsion and fall out, running around, jumping around and bucking around like a show horse. God ain't in none of that. Hollering out your pastor's name like he the only one in the building. God ain't saying nothing about what actual prophecy is going to come to pass, but he's just talking about your pastor. Yep. Oh my. Well, these things we need to know. Why? Because when you stand before God, you cannot say that you didn't know. So I am here to tell you about these things so that you will be knowledgeable and that you will know. And I'm sure perhaps that some of you didn't know and you looked at this and perhaps it has woken you up. I don't know. The information that I'm sharing, perhaps you already know it. And you sitting to yourself thinking, wow, how did he get access to that? You thought you hid it from God? You don't have to go solicit information. You don't have to go solicit and do the things that you got your members doing, which is looking online and basically searching out and sitting up and doing what I call stakeouts. Trying to see what somebody doing and where they at and who they with. You ain't got to do all that with God. Oh, by the way, you ain't got to depend on the powers of darkness either to show you that stuff either. There actually is a true and living God. He actually can show you things. And you devils, you know better than the pastor. You members, you'll get up and you'll sit up and acknowledge this man. Special days, you'll get up and talk about how great of a man of God he is. And you holding this man's secrets. And he cutting up and done, done all kind of God knows what behind closed doors. And you know it and get up and honor this man. You want so bad to have a hero, a champion. You want so bad to have an apostle of the book that Jesus had back in the original 12. You don't see none of the manifestation of that. You never see anything that's, that those 12 did manifesting in this day time, in this day and time. You hadn't seen none of that. In, in what, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and don't tell me about some miracle that you didn't perform back in 1973. And that's the last thing you can tell me about what you've basically been doing. Apostles in Jesus' day, apostles that walk with Christ, these guys were raising folks from the dead every day. Letting the blind, healing the blind, healing the maimed, the cripples. This was a common thing for them. It was just like going to a 9 to 5 for them guys. But you won't see none of that. But you all just throw this apostle, this, this bishop title, you know, loosely on these men. And, you know, this is my, my man of God. And this is my apostle this. And this is my bishop this. Prestige. No different than the Pharisees. Pharisee spirit. As I stated in the last video, enjoy it while you can. This is your heaven. I hope it was all worth it. Yeah, all of that low down stuff you've been doing, Pastor. You pastors out here getting your fill. Filling up on this iniquity. Yeah, around here stealing wives and sleep with other man's wives and having your fill with Destroying families and having your fill with your sex sex capades and around here just doing everything you big and bad enough to do, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Enjoy yourself. Yeah, enjoy yourself. I hope it's all worth it. It has been worth it. And all over the years that you've gotten your fill and you've gotten fat and off the iniquity and enjoyed all of it. Hope you you uh, enjoyed yourself to the fullest. Because it's going to be a different program when you stand before God and you want to get into his church, the one that Jesus Christ is coming back for, the bride, and you want to get in that church 
But then he going to look at you and tell you that depart from me, you work of iniquity. I never knew you. And he going to throw you out of his church, just like you threw the members out. With, no, with that same non-grace and that same non-mercy that you had, pastor. He going to show you that same non-grace, that same non-mercy. He going to tell you, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Yeah. You put the members out your church and he going to put you out of his church. And you devils are following them too. Hmm. I'll tell you what. This right here is nothing to play with. At the end of the day, you got a soul and you got to basically make it somewhere. And perhaps things haven't been done right. Perhaps you played so long to the point where God has just rejected you. Perhaps that's the case. Maybe that's why that you are hell bent on bringing others to hell with you because you know that your time is drawing near. You know your time is drawing nigh and you know that you don't have a chance of salvation. Maybe that's why you don't care. You have no empathy. Maybe you're mad. Maybe you're upset because you missed the mark and you've just decided to ride this thing out till the wheels fall off. Maybe that's it, Pastor. You, Pastor, looking at this. Maybe that's why. You've decided to follow this holiness and use this holiness to your grand scheme and scam to manipulate the people. Because you know you don't have a chance at opportunity of salvation no more. Because you played so much, you played so long, you destroyed so many people's lives that you basically trying to carry as many as you can with you. All in the name of holiness. Imagine that. Imagine that. I have an assignment for you members that are in churches that have a pastor that fits this bill. Actually seek the Lord. Pray that he show you that there is no interference sent from Satan to cause you to see things in a different way. Pray that any spell or any type of chance or any type of witchcraft that is used to blind you in seeing things from what they are and from where, where they are in the, in the church. Pray that the Lord remove all that from your eyes, from the natural and the spiritual, so that you can see things for what they are, so that you can see your pastor for who he is. What, you afraid to pray that? You afraid, you, af you mean to tell me you afraid to pray to, for, for God to show you truth on something? You afraid of that? Then you might as well make your reservation for hell too. Because your shock factor to see your pastor for the demon that he is seems to be greater than your wanting to know the truth factor. What is too much for you? You're going to lose your faith in the Lord because your so-called man of God wasn't all that he say he is and, and he's not all he said he was over the years. You keep secrets, you know things, and you keep his history. Pastor around here buying you lingerie. For what? Why your pastor buying you lingerie? What are you planning on? You using it for him? Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You done had some of that lingerie on for your pastor, haven't you? You done had them little sessions with him. Well, he doing them all ungodly things to you. You knew it was wrong in your spirit, but you were so bewitched, you couldn't stop. Couldn't stop going back to him. Hmm. Y'all better wake up. This ain't nothing to play with. Anyway, I think that's all I have for today. This is going to be part two to deceptive and lying pastors. Do you have one? Do you have one? I think you know the answer to that. That's for you to answer.
you know. I certainly know. But you also know. Anyways, thank you all for tuning in. Um, hmm. All I can say to you is pray. Let God show you. And uh, if he show you these things, great. Then you know what you need to do. If there's resistance and the Lord not showing you, there's a reason for that too. He know whether or not that you've yielded yourself to knowing the truth. And if you truly want to know the truth and you've yielded yourself to it, he's not going to withhold any good thing that you need to know. Not when it involves your soul. So don't listen to what I'm telling you. I think some of you already know the truth to what I'm telling you is the truth. And then there are those of you that sit up and question you on the fence. Forget about what you've heard on this video. Go to God yourself. Let him talk to you. See, won't he bear witness? I'm not worried about it because that what you need to know, he's going to bear witness to that and some. Yeah, he will. Anyways, it's been good. We've been on another episode here with JW. And uh, y'all be good. And if you need to reach out to me, you got any questions, put your comments. Or better yet, I think on this video, why don't you all just email me. Information station JW at gmail.com. Yeah. Send me your questions. And uh, I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. And we'll basically go from there. All right. Y'all have a good one. Peace. <laughs>